All right, so we're going to go through some introductory stuff, talk about uh, a survey that was that took place, and uh, why guests returned to some churches, why they didn't return to other churches. Um, then we're going to go through the why. So why do we care about guest services and engaging guests, etc.? Why should we become a welcoming church? Uh, and then we're going to give a picture of what does being a welcoming church look like right now? So in many ways, you're going to get the curtain peeled back from what our process looks like at Buck Run uh, in terms of the welcome team, but then also in terms of just assimilation and getting guests engaged in the life of the church as a whole. Um, and then... And then we're going to wrap up thinking about how to spot a first-time guest. Like, how do you know someone is a first-time guest? And how to start a conversation with a first-time guest. So kind of thinking through some of those things uh, together. So as we begin, I want you to think about these two experiences. So these are two stories uh, from two different guests, uh, two different perspectives. So, so think about this. Tale of two guests. So Jane is a hairstylist who is invited to the church by a member while cutting hair. So the, the, the members getting their hair cut, engaging in conversations. They talked about her life and the world. But once she shared where she lived, one of our members invited her to, to church. And they were able to have conversations about Jesus, etc. So she lived near the church. She was very non, non-committal, or so she thought. Little did the member know that the Holy Spirit had already been working in the hairdresser's life. In despair of the details, she soon found the website to the church and bravely decided to visit. She fell in love with the church. The website gave her all the information she needed. She found a guest parking spot with ease. People were genuinely friendly. The preacher preached the Bible with conviction and love. Jane decided to follow Christ and was baptized. And now she is smiling, enthusiastic, and an active member of the welcome team of the church. So that's one, one side, one guest. Second guest, Ryan. So Ryan had almost no church backgrounds, but he was clearly searching. So he did something bold, if not audacious, from his perspective. He asked his wife, Bethany, if she and their two daughters would go to church with them. Now, Bethany had a nominal church background, but she was not really interested in going back to church. She found the world outside the church a lot more pleasant than the world inside the church. She nevertheless agreed to go with Ryan just one more time. And there won't be a second visit for them. To begin, the church website was terrible. It had not been updated with the new time of the worship service. So their family of four was late, even though they thought they would arrive on time. Because they arrived late, church members occupied all the closed parking spots. Supposedly, there were guest parking spots, but Ryan could not find any directional signs to them. When they arrived late, a couple at the door greeted them and spoke to them for about two seconds. The two greeters then immediately resumed their private conversation between the two of them, oblivious to the world and the people around them. And when they went to the children's area to check in with their two young daughters, disaster struck. The place was dirty, security was non-existent, and the person that met them complained because they were late. Bethany gave Ryan the look. It was not a happy moment. I'm surprised they even went into the worship service at this point. Uh, They both realized they'd made a bad decision. I won't give you all the details, but to say it plainly, it was not good. And by the way, when members of this church were interviewed, they consistently proclaimed, our church is one of the most friendly churches on the block. And their church is friendly, as long as you know the people inside. As long as you are not a guest... By the way, Bethany and Ryan had a big fight on the way home from church. They were not happy campers. Ryan explained that he would never again return to that church. In fact, he said he would never again go to church, ever again, based off of that one experience. And so the problem, therein lies the problem with many churches. Churches perceive themselves as very friendly, very guest-oriented, very welcoming, because the members are friendly to one another, and they feel welcomed with each other. But they don't think about walking in the shoes of guests or first-time guests specifically. They don't don't look at their facilities, their parking, their their website, uh, their friendliness overall from a guest perspective. Therefore, if you want to know about the overall friendliness of guests and and the overall friendliness of the church, ask first-time guests. 
and not members. And that's going to give you a lot better picture on who you are as a church. And so we're going to, uh, you know, later on kind of talk about areas that we can grow in this. Um, but you just think, you know, that the gospel in many ways is, is majorly at stake in this. This is one way, you know, we trust in the, in the sovereignty and the providence of God to bring sinners to himself, but also recognize we want to, we want to put nothing in the way of, of people being able to hear the gospel and be open and receptive to the gospel. And so, so that's what we're going to think about. Uh, so there's a survey of hundreds of guests, and they revealed the following information. So you've got the results on your sheet, and the specific, request, the, the specific question on the first one related to why guests did not return to a particular church. So why did guests not return to a particular church? And these answers are, are ordered in, in level of, of most results. So number one, number one reason why guests did not return to a particular church was because, because the stand and greet time in the worship service was unfriendly and awkward. The stand and greet time in the worship service was unfriendly and awkward. This is a surprising response that came in by the hundreds of results is number one. There were two issues with the stand and greet time. First, some guests just felt really awkward with the exercise. Because you got to think, they don't know anybody. and they're just, they're just standing there. It seemed to be a ritual more for the members than it was for the guests. Second, a number of guests did not mind the stand and greet time, but they felt very left out during the welcome time because everyone was talking to themselves and they were just standing or sitting and watching. Either they were totally ignored or they were inundated with what they perceived as superficial greetings and not necessarily being completely engaged. So that was one reason. Uh, Secondly, unfriendly church members was the second result in the survey. Most members do not view themselves as unfriendly, but they do not see themselves from the perspective of church guests. They don't usually speak to guests because they don't know them. And the church members usually retreat to the comfort of their own holy huddles of the people they do know. More on that later. We'll talk about holy huddles. (laughs) Third result of the survey, unsafe and unclean children's areas. The response generated the most emotional comments in this in this section as you could probably imagine if your church does not have clear safety and security procedures and if the children's area does not appear clean and sanitary to guests uh, you can pretty much bet that no young families will will ever return fourth response on the survey they had no place to get information on the church no place to get information guests are trained by their experiences to look for a central welcoming area and information but here's the catch some churches did have them but they were hard to find maybe they were split off to the side and maybe they had to walk a ways to get there and some churches had them in very good visible locations what's up (laughs) but they had no one manning the welcome center guests told us that they were hesitant to go to an unmanned welcome center they wanted to engage with people not just walk up to a place with all kinds of information the church might as well not have an information and welcome center if no one will be there to help the guests. Five, a bad church website. Nearly every guest who visits a church nowadays is going to check a church website. Uh, so even if they decide to visit the church after looking at a bad website, uh, they might have a negative disposition when they come to the church itself. The two critical items guests want to see on a church website are first, the physical address of the church, and second, accurate times of the services. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to look at a church website, show up at a time that it says, and it's the wrong time. You're you're asking for trouble uh, right then and there. So keep in mind this reality: the church website, in many ways, is now the front doors to the church uh, in our day and age. So, so will guests feel welcome when they when they look at the website? That's something you want to think about in engaging guests. Sixth response to the survey. Poor signage. If you attend your church for more than a few weeks, you don't necessarily need signage. You know where everything is. But guests do, and they get frustrated when they don't have clear directional signage for for parking, for entrances to the worship center, to the kids' area, um, and other places. Seven, insider church language. 
listen to the words that are used in conversations uh, with one another, or kind of this like Christianese type of language. Listen to announcements, the sermon, casual conversations. Are members saying things that a first-time guest would understand or not? Well, this is one of the things that, that guests who responded to the survey said uh, as a response. They, they said they left some churches saying that too much language was foreign and filled with acronyms. So, you know, think about this. Practically, you just, if you have an acronym for something, we're going to go, we're going to go to DOMs after church. If you're a guest, you have no earthly idea what that means. Uh, DOMs, I don't know is a, if that's a thing. <laughs> but, but, even, but even if you think on a very simple level, like VBS, for example, uh, you can say, hey, VBS is this week. Hey, VBS is coming up. But if you don't actually explain what that acronym means, right. could be in trouble. And, and, and uh, again, I'm giving responses to the, to the survey. I'm not telling you kind of how we do things. This is the survey still at this point. All right, eight, boring or bad church services. So this one, this one was surprising on the survey to see all the way this far down on the list, honestly. Uh, in the past, church leaders of small churches would say they don't have resources for quality services. Uh, but in the digital age, with, with many affordable resources, uh, it's, it's surprising this one's all the way that far down. Nine, members telling guests they were in the wrong pew or chair. Um, I, thought this, I thought this thing disappeared a long time ago. Yeah, but church guests literally said on the survey... Uh, they said the common comment was, you are sitting in my chair. Yeah, I know. Isn't that crazy? Uh, unbelievable. So, 10. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And, and so if you think about it from the guest perspective, if someone says that to you, how receptive are you going to be to anything else? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, last result of, of why guests did not return was dirty facilities. And some of the comments in this section were just absolutely brutal. Uh, like they said, it looks like this church has not been cleaned in months. Um, there were no trash cans anywhere. Restrooms were worse than a bad truck stop. A literal response to the survey. Uh, pews, pews had more stains than a Tide commercial. And so, so you get the picture. A dirty church communicates to all the guests like, we really don't care. And so, so those are the ten reasons, the, the ten top reasons why first-time guests did not return to, to a particular church. Uh -huh. But, like, if to me it's not, I guess, because if I can't get through all these other, that's all the stuff I've got to do just to get to the service. That's true. Yeah. Like, if I can't even make it, like, I can't even figure out what the service is, or it doesn't matter if it's a good one or a bad one, I, can't, I don't know where to go. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. It, you know, if I, if I walk into the door and everybody's, like, hateful. Yeah. I'm just, I'm going to go. That's right. That's like, right. Yeah, that's a that's a good observation because you've got to you've got to go through several different kind of stages or places to get to the worship service. Uh, anything that y'all are surprised to see or surprised to not see on that list? Any other comments on it? Yeah. <laughs> I, every time, every my time. parents love that it happens because they're like a concerned passing it back and forth and I'm like are you concerned and I'm like no <laughs> you know, so like, even in that time there's yeah. going to be something and I'm like oh, that situation is but you know you pass that many many times that that can really be a turn off yeah. that can hurt someone's trip 
Yeah. Well, that's and, and so one of the things. Again, you got. I've got to be. I wanted to be careful, especially the Santa Greet time, because we do it here at Buck Run, uh, and you'll notice that'll come up again in the next survey results. But you know, it's not necessarily the Santa Greet time in and of itself, but it's what you're doing during the Santa Greet time, particularly from the guest perspective. And so, yeah, and we'll talk about more kind of where we're looking to improve, and that's one of those, particularly like. As it comes to trying to station particular people to be looking for first-time guests. We'd like for all of us to do it, but yeah. All right, let's look at the happy, the happy guests, if you will. So why first-time guests returned? So I'm going to answer these with direct quotes uh, from happy guests themselves. So just one for each one. So number one, guest most frequent answer, someone asked the guest to sit with them. Someone said, you know, as a single person, I can feel pretty lonely sitting by myself. I'm so glad, I'm changing the names in these, that Joan asked me to sit with her. We plan to get coffee together this week. Number one response, someone asked the guest to sit with them. Number two, people introduced themselves to the guest. Several people introduced themselves to me. I did not get the impression that it was contrived or routine. So you'd think just number one and two. In many ways, just engaging and being intentional. Number three, there was clear signage from the parking lot to the children's area to the worship center. Everything was clearly marked. It was easy to navigate. Four, there was a clearly marked welcome center. It made it really easy for me to ask questions and to get some information on the church. Five, the kids loved the children's area. My kids were so happy with their experiences. We will be back for sure. Six, the children's area was secure and sanitary. That is one of the first things I check when I go to a church. This church gets an A plus is what a, what a guest said. Seven, guest parking is clearly visible. From the moment we drove into the parking lot, I could find the guest parking. It was marked very well. Eight, the church did not have a stand and greet time. <laughs> My wife and I just moved to the area and are visiting churches. If we visit one with that fake stand and greet time, we, will not, we don't return. We don't go back twice. Nine, the members were not pushy. They seemed to really care about us rather than just making us another member on their, another number on their membership role. And ten, the guest card was simple to complete. Some of the cards in other churches ask for way too much information. This one was perfect and simple. Now, disclaimer, these are not all answers from our church. These are this general guest service survey by Rainer Research. Um, but those are the 10 reasons why, why guests returned back to, back to a church. Anything surprising? Anything stand out? Any comment? Yep. So it's like what, I, and so I think it's like the same thing. Like it's more about what you're doing during that time. Like you either have it or don't. Yep. Because you, you can't help it if you don't like it. But yeah. What you're doing during that time. That's right. That's right. Yeah, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you breathe on your hand and then you. <laughs> That's right. And so, in all of this, don't hear, I'm not at all wanting to communicate like, oh, we just need to trash our saying Greek time. I'm merely just giving results at this point. And so, from a survey. So. Um, about eight out of ten guests, it says, had an experience that they would that would fit better in the unhappy guest category than one that would fit into the happy 
guest category. And, and sadly, few church members can, can recognize this for themselves. It's, it's easier to hear this from the guest perspective than, than necessarily the member perspective. Uh, so yeah, so let's jump into the why. So why care about guests? So the Bible has, has a lot to say about biblical hospitality uh, directly, but then you also, when you think about the gospel as a whole and, the, and redemption in Christ, uh, you see hospitality all over the place. Is God welcoming sinners into a relationship with him and, and creating a, 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 an earth, a garden to enjoy immediately, and then to come, a city, that he will be our God. He will be our host. He will welcome us. He will bring us into the city. So we're going to look at that briefly. So specific texts on, on, on hospitality. You see those referenced to he, in your sheet. Romans twelve thirteen. Pursue hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. 1 Peter 4, 9. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. 1 Peter 2, or 1 Peter 3, 2 through 3. This is talking about the leaders of the church. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. Likewise, Titus 1, 7 through 8. As an overseer of God's household, he must be blameless, not arrogant, not hot-tempered, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, righteous, holy, and self-controlled. Now we see these direct quotations about hospitality, but we see also in Scripture, hospitality in many ways just intertwined and and showing the gospel in and of itself. So think, Genesis 1, 28 through 30. God said to them, Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves. Right? And God says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth. Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So, so if you think about all the places where every or everything is mentioned here, uh, Dustin Willis says, Genesis 1 reads like the most gracious host in the world is welcoming you into his, into his castle. I'd like to think of it as like into his paradise. And he says, look, it's all yours. Everything I've made it meticulously for you. It's like a parent who beams with delight as their children open gifts on Christmas morning. And that's God saying, here, here's everything I've created. Take it. So Genesis 3, the fall. Adam and Eve betrayed, disobeyed God's will. They willingly rebelled against his authority, and in so doing, they neglected the gracious hospitality that God had offered. Yet God responded with grace by seeking them out, right? We know this. This is the gospel. They did not die on the day they sinned, as God earlier seemed to imply in Genesis 2, 16 through 17. Instead, God sewed clothes for them to cover their nakedness and to, their, and to cover their shame. And he foreshadowed not only how he had provided them through working the ground, but he foreshadowed a promised redeemer who had crushed the enemy who seduced them into sin, Genesis 3.15. So in this story, Moses, and, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, the biblical author, introduced a central tension that plays itself out all the way throughout the scriptures. How is God to continue to, to make a relationship, make a way, in many ways be hospitable, be gracious to, to us, his creation, to humanity as he is holy and cannot dwell with evil, right? Even though Adam and Eve are put outside the Garden of Eden because of their challenge to their creator and to his holiness, God initiated a way to continue to be in relation to his now fallen creation. God, God is showing hospitality, showing mercy, right? 
And I'm not saying mercy and hospitality are the same thing, but see, showing mercy is a form of being hospitable and gracious and, and a host. Genesis 12, God told Abraham, then, then his name is Abram, that he was going to form a special people from his descendants, a people who would be gods, and to put him on display throughout all the earth. He said, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will then be a blessing to the nations, Genesis 12, 2. Then he continued, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, Genesis 12, verse 3. This, this shows that God's purpose for picking Abram, Abraham's family, is to represent him so that they could be hospitable, that they could share the mercies through their word and then through action to the nations of the earth. This choice of a people was ironic in many ways because the people that God chose uh, to be a great nation, Israel, was known to be the smallest and most alienated of all the nations. They were the runts of the, of the litter, if you will. Yet God lavished his mercy and love on them for a purpose that extended far beyond them. So the entire Old Testament, we see God's hospitality in many ways all throughout to a special people the way in which he pursues the way in which he cares for and loves his people to a special people the israelites he invited them into a relationship with him and taught them what community with with god looks like even though they continually sinned and turned to false gods just as adam and eve had time and time again god pursued them and he put the welcome mat if you will out when they decided to return back to him so this story culminates in the ultimate act of God sending his son through the lineage of Israel to make a way once for all for repentant men women and children to be restored in their relationship with God in Christ God satisfied his own demand for holiness he substituted his holiness for our wickedness and his death for ours so that he could invite us back to a relationship with him and continue to care for us Romans 5, 6 through 11. Jesus left the comfort of his home in heaven to live a hard-working carpenter's life, become a traveling homeless evangelist, and then be crucified by the very people he had come to save. And as the Son of God rose to life on the third day after his crucifixion, the door of the tomb rolled open away for men, women, and children to finally be in a right relationship with the Father. God God did this so that ultimately we can live with him forever in harmony in his forever home. The new, the, not the new apostle, the apostle John. There's no new apostles. Very clearly hear that. The apostle John. <laughs> he, <laughs> I can't believe it. I just said that. He, he received a vision of this coming heavenly home that God is, God is bringing about. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the, thr from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. So the Bible begins with God making a home for humanity to dwell with him in a garden. And the Bible ends with God making a home for believers to dwell with him in a city. These bookends of scripture mean that not only did God do what he set out to do in the beginning, but somehow... Through all the mess of our sin and all the mess of humanity, he actually made a home to share with us that is much bigger and better than even we could have imagined in the first place. So the story of creation ends with this, this vibrant new Jerusalem coming down from the clouds in a great spectacle. And God makes a home for us to dwell with him where we will be his people and he will be our God. We see this in Jeremiah 32, Ezekiel 37, Revelation 21, 3. God finished what he started in the garden, and this grand act of hospitality is made possible only by his continued grace. 
His grace is made evident through his hospitality towards sinners like us. Throughout the the ages of history, God consistently initiates relationship. He's the initiator. He is the gracious host, constantly welcoming in wayward sinners who deserve his wrath. A people whose only hope is that he would show them undeserving hospitality. If there's been a stranger in need, someone completely excluded and hopeless, fully dependent on the grace of another, that is every single one of us. We are out in the cold, victims of our own folly, victims of our own selfishness, freezing to death from the coldness of our own hearts. And all throughout history, God opens the door. He rescues us and welcomes us back into a relationship through sheer and inexplicable grace. For those of us in Christ, we've been grafted into the same mission. According to 2 Corinthians 5.18, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, proclaiming the good news that, that he's made a way for our sins to be forgiven. He's made a way for, for traitors to sit at his table again. And he invites us into, into that ministry, that ministry of, welcome, of, of reconciliation that he has proclaimed since the beginning of time. Anytime we practice hospitality, we put human flesh on the gospel story. So, so look at the verse at the very top of your sheet, Romans 15, 7. Welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. For the glory of God. Uh, Willis, another quote from him, said, Hospitality is a theology of recognition where through simple acts we convey the truth that wayward sinners are made in the image of God. Where we say to those who might doubt their worth or purpose, I see you. You are welcome here. Pull up a chair. And then we, we don't just stop with the actions, but we verbally tell them the love that, that God has for them. In the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's the why behind why this matters. Any thoughts? Any questions? <laughs> Your face. <laughs> That's right. Don't make those comments and welcome guests. Thankfully, she's not a guest. <laughs> so, so does that does the does that make sense? Like in thinking through why why do we welcome guests? Why do we show hospitality? And you think about this on a very personal, like relational level, and and in your own home, and the relationships with folks you have, but even on a on a bigger level of the church as a whole. Why this matters for us as a, as a church. Um, uh, you know, I won't, say, I won't say their name, but, you know, we had several guests three weeks ago-ish, about 60, 60 guests or so come to our church, and, and there's a woman who's, whose child, was, whose little infant was crying, went out of the back of the service. Many of you probably were in that service, know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, but one of our church members immediately got up with her and walked out to think through, okay, here's, like, how can we help you? What can we do for you, et cetera, knowing that, that she was a guest. And so even thinking through those moments, and those moments happen, that's a big example, but in small ways, they happen all the time of thinking through, okay, how can I, how can I serve you? And we'll talk about that particularly towards the end. Um, so, Great. Let's think through briefly, what are we doing here at Buck Run in in welcoming guests? And now now we'll get into what does this look like for us as a church. Uh, So tied into this is kind of our assimilation process as a whole. And so the Buck Run Baptist Church, our assimilation process begins when a guest first visits the church for any reason. You know, there can be all kinds of different motivations of bringing someone to the church. And that process ends when that person becomes connected and committed with the people, ministries, and programs that drive the mission of the church. So when they're committed. So, so when we say assimilation, we're thinking through this entire process. How are people coming from first-time guests into being completely committed? And that means 
they're actively involved in worship. They're members. They're plugged into a community group. They see the, the value of adult discipleship classes, and they're doing all they can to go to those, and they're finding a place to serve. That's what, that's what completely assimilated, assimilated look like, looks like. So our assimilation process oh, it got cut off. I, I grabbed the wrong one, sorry. But you can see it decent enough. Begins, so first-time guests, all we're focusing on is we're focusing on hospitality, engaging first-time guests with hospitality. And then once first-time guests, we receive any information from them. So that can come in the Connect card. That can come through an interpersonal relationship. That can even come when they're dropping their kids off for uh, children's ministry. There's kind of different ways in which that comes. Once we receive information, we're following up with them. So that follow-up process looks like a six-week intentional engagement where they're receiving emails, phone calls, text messages if, if they had allowed themselves to, to receive those. Uh, they're receiving a welcome letter from Dr. York. Uh, we're trying to have intentional touches with those guests all throughout six weeks. Um, I think you just, y'all came out of that process, what, a couple months ago or so? Yeah. Um, so it's a pretty <laughs> weekly routine so you follow up with their information, and you're getting, you're getting folks information, hoping to, hoping to further connect them into the life of the church. And the ultimate purpose is not to grow our church numbers, but to, as a church, be growing into the image and likeness of Christ. Like, hear that as the ultimate purpose. It's not to make Buck Run, like, the biggest church at all. Um, but through that information, intentionally following up to hopefully meet with them as a, as a pastoral team, talk about them with, about the gospel, get them, uh, if they need to be baptized, into membership, etc. And so one of the big ways to connect with folks is through Discover Buck Run, um, and then through a pastoral interview, and then really through both of those, uh, an individual or a couple will be presented to the church. So everyone who's being presented to the church, uh, as new members, you can think, have been first-time guests very recently, and so that's an easy way to to engage engage on this level. And then the assimilation process does not stop when someone becomes a member, but we want to intentionally be be seeking people out once they're once they're completely assimilated. So we want to we want to work them into being committed to to our people, to our mission, and to our ministries here at Buck Run. Um, and that doesn't mean that someone has to be actively involved in every single thing that we're doing here, but being involved on, on the large scale of adult discipleship and, and plugged into community and serving. Um, and that looks like various things. But that's, that's what this process looks like. And of course, in every category, there's kind of an, an off-ramp. Because um, someone can be a first-time guest and we don't receive any information and then they fl- fall into this kind of like repeat guest category. Um, but is there any questions about about what that process looks like? For our purposes this morning, we're going to stop at the hospitality level. Uh, but if you're interested in, in more of what that looks like, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk to you. So hospitality, guest services. My favorite, my favorite quote, my boy Danny Franks, the gospel is offensive, nothing else should be. So let the gospel be the, the only thing that offends people um, when they're here. So the hope and the goal in all that we do here, particularly as it pertains to hospitality and welcoming guests, is we want to be gospel-centric and guest-friendly. We want to be guest-friendly and gospel-centric. So doing everything we can to welcome and engage first-time guests, be hospitable, but then say like, hey, let's take out any barrier that we can for people to, to hear the good news of Christ um, in, this, in the sermon, ultimately, is the ultimate place and where that, that happens. But then even on a community group level or adult discipleship, whatever it might be. So our welcome team, when it comes to hospitality, this is a map, if you will, of what it looks like. What this does not include, and, and where Paul just went to go be, I'm assuming, is the parking, the parking team. And so 
you know, you think the parking team is out here. We've got several folks. Bobby stands at the, at the entrance to, to our church, and he's really directing people on where to go on a general level. Now, there's a sign that goes out there. If you're a first-time guest or if you are handicapped, to let Bobby know and so that he can direct you to each, each of those spots intentionally to where, wherever that might be. Um, and then Paul and, and Dennis Lures and, and a couple others who serve on that team are communicating with Bobby on where spots are so that we can best serve, serve guests. Um, and then we have first-time guest spots. In many ways, anyone who, who parks there, are, they are volunteering themselves and saying, I am a first-time guest. Come talk to me. Uh, and so uh, we'll talk about what that looks like in a second. Welcome, greeters. So these are everyone who, who stands at the outer entryways to the door. So office door up top, you've got the main two entrances, children's wing, and then adult discipleship. Uh, those folks are the first faces that you'll see after the parking team. So they'll hold the door open. Their responsibility is really just to smile, to greet, make you feel welcome. Um, and then if they're asked a question, to, to hopefully walk with folks uh, to whatever, whatever that is they might be looking for, a restroom, children's area, adult discipleship, whatever that might be. Um, and then tour guides. So ideally... If welcome greeters are asked a question, they're trying to connect them with tour guides. If they leave, tour guides will fit into that spot. But tour guides are in many ways like the, the rovers of the church. And so tour guides are intentionally looking for those people. Uh, I really encourage them, whenever someone's parking in this first-time guest spot, literally just be looking for when someone parks there and, and look to engage them. Uh, now, not in, a, not in a creepy way, as we're going to talk about in starting a conversation with a first-time guest, but just recognize they are they are a first-time guest. Uh, tour guides are also looking for people who might not park in the first-time guest spot, but might be uh, might come in as a first-time guest and look around, knowing that they're not familiar with where they are. So how can we help you? And then they're also there. They've got welcome team name tags to assist on, on a very general level anyone who's here at the church who has a question, might have a need, et cetera, just being able to show hospitality as the church. Um, so you'll see the number of our tour guides, particularly in the worship service hour before worship service. There's a, there's a, a much greater number of tour guides at that time than there's adult discipleship time because um, we just see a, a, a large influx of people uh, those tour guides right now is, is the whole Pfeiffer family, and so they're just kind of lined up all the way throughout, which, which works out really well. And then last, we have worship greeters. So these are, in many ways, the bulletin hander outers, and, and they hand out bulletins, welcome folks, uh, greet them as they, as they walk into the sanctuary, uh, and, and very similar to welcome greeters being a smiling face, being warm and, and hospitable. Any questions about what that looks like on a very kind of positional level? Our intentionality with guests here at Buck Run does not, does not wholly consist in the welcome team, but, but it is in many ways where it begins. And so there's other aspects of where we're trying to be hospitable through, you know, coffee being offered, um, and other things, but but this is an intentional process in that. One area that we're trying to we're seeking to grow in is is as you might have noticed recently in the in the last several weeks, uh, the sanctuary is getting very full, and so having intentional folks who can be identifying where open seats are in the sanctuary and helping uh, show guests or, or whoever may be coming in a little bit later uh, where those seats are, and so one way. If you're in this room, kind of thinking through how can we how can we serve people, is is try to try to allow there to be seats together for those who come in a little bit later, or after you, after you do. Yeah, uh, so that's something kind of our senior leadership will assess if we're having that much consistency and high attendance. So right now, um, a few weeks ago we had a, we had a large spike in guests, um, but we haven't seen that 
that growth in, in, in our attendance on a consistent basis. If that were the case, there would probably be more, more steps in place and what that would look like. Um, but right now, we do on average in the worship service somewhere, somewhere around like 600 and 600 to, yeah, 600 to 650 is how many people are in our worship service. Um, and it seats a couple hundred more than that. And so it looks very full. There are a good amount of seats. So right now, trying to compact folks to open up those seats. Um, but as Chris said, an overflow room would probably be the next the next step. Yeah. Now, um, areas to grow. So we'll kind of go back to the home slide. What I wanted to show you is finish there. Areas to grow that I see is, is the, the usher type squad in there. Um, trying to identify people in, in certain sections of where they normally sit to be able to look out for guests and engage guests. I see that as an area that we can grow in. Um, continue to just be generally outward focused towards guests. Develop leaders who embody a hospitable spirit. Um, and then intentionally following up with guests after initially meeting them. So that would be an encouragement for y'all. Is if you meet a guest, don't let it just stop there at the meeting. Uh, but seek to grab coffee with them. Seek to connect with them. Uh, I'm meeting with a couple right now who they're just blown away that that uh, one of our church members noticed that she was having a uh, just kind of an emotional morning in many ways and said, hey, let's grab coffee this week. And she barely knows her, uh, but just being intentional in that way. All right, so back to your sheet. There you have your little handout. Let's go on the back page. Think through briefly how to spot a first-time guest. So how to spot a first-time guest. Uh, and this is an article by uh, Danny Franks as, that is super helpful. So first, you can spot a, a first-time guest when they're heading towards the wrong door uh, or the wrong parking spot or the wrong uh, building. I mean, that's not necessarily a problem here. Uh, the, wrong, the wrong room, the wrong area. You know, if you see someone not with kids or with students walking towards the kids' area, uh, they might be going to the wrong place unless they're picking up a kid. But... Um, Seasoned people know the rules. They know where to park. They know where to walk. They know when to get there. If a guest looks lost, and if you have an observant team, you can help them get to their destination. So, so you spot a guest that way. Secondly, you can spot a first-time guest when they're slowing down as they approach a place, when they're intentionally kind of slowing down. Seasoned folks confidently maneuver around the church. Like, like they're not thinking twice about it. Um. And the front doors, but guests do not. If they start to slow their pace down, chances are that they're new. If they're, especially in the in the sanctuary, I like to say this to, to folks on our welcome team. If they walk into our sanctuary and they kind of take a take a little pause and they're slowing down, and they're looking around at the signage trying to figure out their placement on, on where to go, that that identifies them right out of the gate. Uh, which goes into number three: looking around, looking up. A first-timer will try to take it all in. They're looking for visual cues, signs, banners, and overheads that allow them and let them know that they're in the right spot. Four, as Paul mentioned earlier, uh, first-time guests might be over or underdressed. If you're a casual crowd and a guy shows up in a three-piece suit, he could be a fancy hipster or he could be dressing for what he thinks your church expects. And so, uh, you know, both of those engage. And, and at Buck Run, we have a good variety in, in, in what people wear. Some people do wear uh, full suits. Other people wear uh, blue jeans and a, and a button-down. Others will wear T-shirts. Uh, number five, really late or really air early. Your regulars are probably the ones showing up uh, at, the, at, the, at the normal service time. But guests typically will arrive up to 10 minutes late. And so, so when you see folks walking in a little bit later, uh, there's a good chance that they might be guests. And so thinking through how can we serve those people. Number six, first-time guests, you can spot them 
as they text a lot. Uh, sure, this could be a sign of any 12 to, to 60 year old in our church, but it could also be the sign of a first time guest who's trying to find a friend or someone they're trying to meet at the church or just trying to look busy so that they don't look awkward. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for those people um, and see, see how you can serve them. So that's how you can spot first time guests. Now, how to start a conversation with a first-time guest. Now, this is a great question to ask, um, but do not uh, engage people by saying, you know, I don't know who you are uh, or who you think you are, but you're sitting in my chair. Don't, don't let that be the first time that you try to engage with somebody. Um, and, and I would also encourage you not to ask, like, is this your first time? Um, you can really get in trouble with that one. You can ask that to somebody who you might not recognize or who may have been uh, gone for a while and they've been a member for the church longer than you've been alive. And so uh, in my case, don't do that. In your case, I would encourage you not to because that can really make guests defensive. It can, it can put them on the defensive. It's a knee-jerk reaction to a question that makes them feel like they're an outsider and they've got to scramble to build some sort of narrative that bridges themselves to you. So just don't put them in that, in that situation. We should do all that we can. And, and think about hospitality. We should do all that we can to just observe, absorb the awkwardness of any situation. So you try to absorb all of that awkwardness onto yourself. That means, that means we take the burden of weirdness off of their shoulders and we place it on ours. And that translates even into the small details of, of conversation. So, so let's say you spotted a first-time guest in the lobby. How do you start the conversation? Here's a few, a few favorite practices. Number one, walk slowly through the crowd. Walk slowly through the crowd. Making a beeline towards a first-time guest <laughs> can make them feel like they've been put on the spot. <laughs> it may be better to warm them up by letting them see you talking to lots of people, kind of greeting people along the way, as opposed to just targeting them and going guns blazing. <laughs> so walk slowly through the crowd. Number two, start with generics, move to specifics. What I mean by that is, is make eye contact with an individual. Smile and a good morning always serves as a great kickoff to any conversation. Uh, you don't have to go in for the kill from the very first moment you see somebody <laughs> trying to engage. Is this a first-time guest? Third, I'm not sure we've met. This is one of my personal favorite lines to use. You're shouldering more of the responsibility for knowing them or for not knowing them, acknowledging that you may have met them before, which is, a, which is great. Because like, if you're like me, I forget people's names all the time, and I... I think I may have seen you before, and I might have never seen you in my life. Um, so give them an opportunity to open up the conversation. Say, I'm not sure we've met before. Uh, my name is Matt. And try to absorb as much of that awkwardness. Assess their longevity. Assess their longevity. Now is the time to figure out how long they've been around so that you can best help them. After initial small talk, you can ask, how long have you been attending Buck Runner? How long have you been been at Buck Run. If they answer a few months or more, you have an opportunity to see how their connection process is going. So kind of in that whole assimilation process, where they're at. If they say a few weeks or less, or even better, this is my first day, you get to play the hero by being genuinely excited to meet them and suggest a simple next step. Invite them to sit with you. Invite them to meet together, whatever that might be. Uh, number five, don't assume their desire for proximity. Don't assume their desire for proximity. Some guests may prefer to fly solo on their first visit. Others may really be looking for a friend. So be open to kind of both of those options. And don't be offended at either one. You can, you can help with this by asking if they have someone to sit with or someone to go to lunch with. Someone they're meeting, etc. Other questions to kind of get into that. 
And finally, find a way to follow up. Remember their name. Try to, try to write it down or put it as a note in your phone. And make a point to help them after the service just to check in. If appropriate, give them your contact inform- information or swap for theirs. The first visit is a big deal, yes, but it's often what happens just after the first visit. Like, like a personal note that will determine whether a guest comes back or not. Um, and so I would love to, love to help get, get everybody on board and thinking through some of this. And so, uh, so yeah, that's what I would encourage and be our guest. If you'd like to serve on the welcome team and you're not on the welcome team, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, and then lastly, real quick, since I brought these out, in thinking about guest services and hospitality, these are some of my favorite books. I'm a book guy. I love books. Um, so two that were massive, well, number one, entitling this class, Be Our Guest, Perfecting the Art of Customer Service. No one does it better than Disney. Uh, it's Disney talking through their guest services and hospitality. And then Tom Rainer, Becoming a Welcoming Church. So the name of this class, Be Our Guest, Becoming a Welcoming Church. Um, third, The Simplest Way to Change the World. Biblical Hospitality is a Way of Life. Uh, this is by Dustin Willis, Brandon Clements. The, some of those quotes that I mentioned are by Dustin Willis in this book. So this is a great book, particularly as it comes to, to hospitality in your home is what it talks about. But even on a general kind of theology of hospitality, great resource. Uh, another one, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. This is more theology, uh, kind of just general hospitality. Um, Rosaria Butterfield, great resource. That one puts a dent in his work ethic. Does it? Like, you start reading it, and you're like, I'm a dirty diaper. Yep. Like, you just feel like Yep. Uh, next, first impressions. If you want to think through kind of like what first impressions are you giving off as a church, uh, you've got to be careful with some of these books. But as a general, they can be helpful in thinking through. Creating wow experiences in your church. Uh, it's been helpful for me in thinking through kind of what do people see when they come in. And then the comeback effect this is what I'm reading right now. It's great. How hospitality can compel your church's guests to return. And so this really kind of bridges all of these things and, and gets at what we're talking about today. So, great. That's all I've got. Thanks, y'all, for being here. <laughs>